thank for each and every one that's here. We ask now for your blessings on our service. And I pray, O oh Lord, that you'd help us to glorify and honor you in all that's said and done. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, page one. We'll worship the King. If you have that, I'd like to stand. <clears throat> Alright, you can be 
seated for one moment. <clears throat> there was something else I was going to say, and it hit two sides of my head and disappeared. But anyway, <clears throat> we will have birthday Sunday uh, this coming up, since we're going to throw back um, to April 1st with Brother Harness being here. So we'll have April, I mean, we'll have our, our birthday Sunday, so we will honor those and sing happy birthday and have a little fellowship afterward. You know, we get it twice in a row, so this is a good thing. Again, uh, Pastor Harness will be here on April 2nd. We will plan on him having the first two services and then uh, having a, our international uh, potluck, and then we will have hopefully a, a short uh, uh, message, a more brief message after the um, uh, potluck. Uh, I, I warned him. I said, Paul, some people may need to go and others may need to sleep. So I said, you just need to be aware of that. But anyway, um, all right. Uh, also, Easter Sunday, April 9th. I just, uh, just want you to be aware of these uh, things that are happening. And for the life of me, I can't think of what the other thing was. I didn't write it down. I thought of it just then. You know. Well, anyway. Um, uh, yeah, I did want to mention that too, but that wasn't it. Uh, I, 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 we're going to give these cards out uh, that on that Sunday service. Uh, not the Sunday school, but the Sunday service on the second um, uh, to everybody, if you haven't got one, we'll, we'll give the cards out and give you an opportunity to fill them out in the service, and we'll take um, them in an offering for Faith Promise. And we will also have a, a second offering for our guest speaker, um, if you want to give to him for that. And so anyway, just to let you know, um, we've already got his hotel room, and so he will, he will definitely be with us. I was trying to think if there was anything else that was happening that I need to praise you of. And I think that's it, uh, unless this thing comes and bounces back in. Turn to Mother Daughter Kate on the 6th, May 6th. Yeah. I, 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 I can't hear you. The Mother Daughter Tea on May 6th. Oh, I hadn't, no, I hadn't started on that yet. Okay. Um, so go ahead on 227, if you would turn to page 227. The wonderful thing about being the pastor, since I'm up here, if I think of it, I can tell you. <laughs> it's not like I'm stuck if I, if I lose it. Of course, as much as I'm losing now. 227, if you have that, please stand. I have made this comment before, but we were talking with a man today. He gave me his business card, 
And I turned around and I said, I'd like to give you mine too, but I said, um, most people just want to throw it away when they see it. He said, well, you know, why would I do that? I said, well, you haven't seen it yet, you know. And um, he seen it. He said, oh, no, 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 I'm not like that at all. I said, well, some people are. I said, matter of fact, I've gotten into the habit now. When somebody asks me what I do for a living, I said, um, I'll tell you if you promise not to run. And if you get that out of them, usually they'll sit there. But if you don't get that, it's usually an excuse and they're gone. But I'll tell them, I said, okay, first of all, you asked. You understand that? Yeah, 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 what do you do? I said, before I tell you, you got to promise not to run. Yeah, yeah, I'm not going anywhere. I said, you promise now. You're giving me your word. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, okay. And so I tell them, you know, <laughs> so most of the time you see they want to go immediately. You know, I understand. It doesn't bother me. I kind of make it into a game and make it lighthearted like that. And you'd be surprised when you turn things like that lighthearted, just how much of an inroad you can actually get because then they'll talk about it because, it, you know, you both understand where you're at. So it's, it's kind of funny. But anyway. That's free. All right, we were in uh, Second Peter. Uh, we're still in chapter one. We'll be there till two thousand and thirty-four. But anyway, so we're in Second Peter chapter one. If you go to verse eight, um, we had talked about for if these things be in you and abound, they make you that you should neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. We were pretty much finishing this up, and I had. Uh, made the statement, if the believer never grows and gains spiritual sight, um, it's an indication, really, that they are blind. They don't see spiritual things. And if they're blind, then you, you, you don't see the dangers that you may be walking into, that your lifestyle might be leading you into. Um, there are a lot of things that are hidden to people. And if you don't believe me, as a child of God, if you're growing in Christ, begin to talk to somebody who's lost about the things of God. And you'll find out just how blind they are. Just how much is really hidden. Yes, sir. And in talking to people, you, you said they are not into spiritual things. And they seem to be, but it's the wrong spirits. Oh, you know, boy, that's a whole different direction. But that's true. You know, I... And, mm, 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 mm. Boy, I have a, I do address this later on, um, and I'll address it now, and if I catch it later on, I'll just bypass it. But I, what I've really found amazing for me is there are people out there, and I'm talking to them, and they're claiming to be a Christian, and they're, they're, you know, they talk about all these things and, and, and how they're living for God and everything, and, and I'm sitting there thinking, if you're living for God, why are you drinking that beer? If you're living for God... Why are these words slipping out your mouth? You know what I'm saying? So there's, there's some easy indications that they're not living for God, but yet they're sitting there talking about how they're living for God, and, and they're having a lot of struggles. And then I, there's this other type that I run into, and they probably are saved, and they're talking about you know, how much um, they would like to live for God, but, or how much they're just struggling, and, and they're afraid because of all these struggles that they're not saved. So the one is, is probably unsaved, but he's very happy in proclaiming salvation and living the way he wants and claiming to be a Christian. The other is struggling, and because they're struggling, they, they think they're not saved. In actuality, that one that's struggling is probably saved and is, is just fighting these things, this old flesh and the old sin habits. You know, I remember when, when Marlon... I'm going to call his name because it's been so many years ago, and I doubt if he understands English today. Um, he may. Uh, I remember Marlon asked me one time, um, he said he had a problem, and he, he didn't know what to do. And he asked me if I could help in a way. I said, well, what's your problem? He said, um, I can't tell you. I'm like, wow, that's a kind of tough one. And, and, and I, have, I have some things I normally tell people when they're struggling that, that that if they don't want to tell me, and it's, we can work through that. But he really was having a hard time, and, and he kept talking about his struggles, his struggles, his struggles. And I finally, the Lord just laid it on my heart, and I told him, I said, Marlon, you're struggling, right? He said, yeah. I said, well, tell you what, you call me when you quit. When you no longer struggle with these things, we got a problem. The Christian life is a struggle. You'll always struggle. Uh, we're talking about here, um, 
It says, if these things be in you and abound and make you that you shouldn't be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's a struggle. If you're going to get these things in your life, it's going to be a struggle. Uh, Satan doesn't want them in. The flesh doesn't want them in. Your carnality is going to fight against it. Um, it, it. It is, but that's fine. The struggle is what makes you strong. Giving up is what's going to weaken you. But the struggles will make you strong. Um, <clears throat> I think, uh, just in closing this verse off, uh, I see that this thing is, is pointing out um, a, lot of, uh, a lot of the need to have these things in our life. Uh, you know, we need to, to strengthen ourselves. I guess I should have went on to the, the next verse, because actually 9 is what we was finishing up, and I read 8. But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off, and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. I'm sorry. I give you the wrong verse and didn't explain the, the next one. Uh, so going to 10, it says, Wherefore the rather, brethren, given diligence to make your calling and election sure, for if you do these things, you shall never fail. Uh, fall, excuse me. Um, wherefore, on account of what we have in 9, what's going before, actually, you could probably take it all the way up to verse 1 or 2. Or, I would probably no, go no further than three. But anyway, wherefore, on account of the truth we have already been taught about, we've already been uh, given to us, it says the rather. The rather. The idea is to, you ought to be more willing. You ought to be more ready. Uh, you ought to be willing to, to, to tackle this sooner and to a greater degree. This ought to be a focus of, of, of your life. You really need to understand the importance here. And that's exactly what he's driving at. Uh, wherefore, on the account of this truth, the, the rather, brethren, you really need to lock this in. He says, brethren, uh, brothers and sisters in Christ, those who have accepted Jesus Christ as Savior. And then we have the command, give diligence. You know, again, in, in my uh, opinion, we hear, we have the expression of a need to have a testimony. If you're going to be an ambassador for God, if you're going to live your vocation, your calling of God, you really need to have a testimony. How, how, how can you uh, live for God if you don't have a testimony for God? I mean, isn't that the question? Uh, if, you, if you don't have any of these things uh, in your life, um, what, do, what kind of testimony do you have to loss? What kind of testimony would you have to the to, to babes in Christ, if you're not, and I'm going to use the word striving, if you're not earnestly contending, if we go into Jude, he said, earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered. If you're not earnestly contending for the th things that God would have you, um, uh, let me rephrase that, that God would impart into your life. Because that's what he wants to do, really. God wants to impart some things. Um, let me give you my version of these virtues. These virtues are gifts that God says, well, not really gifts, but they're, they're things God wants to give you. But He just can't out and out give you them. You have to be willing to work for them. Call them wages. Don't call them gifts. I don't want to use the term gifts because that lays a wrong impression. But if you'll contend, if you'll be diligent, if you'll strive, you will attain to these. You will get these things if, if that's what you're after. Um, but we strive to be Christ-like. We strive to, so those that look at our testimony would understand, these are some things I can do too. How many of you remember your life before you were saved? How many of you are proud of your life before you were saved? You know, I can't say I'm proud of my life before I was saved. But I can look back now and I can see by being diligent how God has blessed me. That diligence, and, and I think that's the point. Those people that, you know, new Christians or the lost, they're sitting here and they're struggling or, or whatever in their life, and they see you and they're like, they look like they're having peace in this situation. This is a terrible situation. Or they, they have something in their life that, that I would like a part of. And that's part of that growing and, and becoming more Christ-like. Um, how did you get saved? I'm looking for some specifics here in the, in the idea of what Scripture tells us 
Um, when I say that, you understand you were a sinner. When I say how you get, how did you get saved, you understand you were a slave to sinner. The word in scripture in the Greek is doulos. The idea is you are, were bound, you were in bondage. Christ bought you out of the slave market. And if he bought you, shouldn't that give you the idea that we should exert ourselves to carry out what God purchased us for? That vocation, that calling. Um, how can you, and, and we're beating a horse a little bit here, how can you achieve that calling? How can you achieve the goal of your calling or your vocation, if you would, uh, by, uh, which is, I would say, leading others to Christ, leading them to salvation, however you want to phrase it. And then after they're led to Christ, after they become a believer, then you have to disciple these individuals uh, through it or by or, or in the Word of God, if you would, however you want to do it. And, and you do that. What's the pur purpose of discipleship? Mm -hmm. And I thought I was going to be this perfect little person walking around. And of course, there was no follow up. And so I found I got discouraged because I couldn't do it. I said, Lord, I can't do this. I think that is one of the things you, you, you face is discouragement because really you, you, you're almost, and if I can say it this way, it's probably not proper. You almost sometimes feel like you're just thrown out to the wolves. I mean, you're just left to yourself. Your your friends still going the old way, and you you know there's not usually a whole bunch of Christians. If you're not in a church, you know you don't have that fellowship. That you know, I was a little different. You know, I had been in church. The church really wasn't a solid church. Um, I didn't know that then, uh, but the Lord had already done something in my life. And, and all I needed was somebody to tell me. And it's interesting because I had these friends I was still trying to be friends with, drugs and drinking and all that. I wouldn't do a part of it, but I was still around them when they did it. And the pastor says, you can't do that. And I was telling him, I said, what do I do here? How do I handle these people? He said, well, you can't have fellowship with them anymore. I said, I can't have fellowship. They're my friends. <laughs> They're the only ones I know. You know? I, it wasn't like I lived in the city. We lived in the country, you know. Closest house was half a mile away or whatever it was. You know? So it wasn't like you had a whole lot of people. And I'm like, but for me, it was like, okay, if that's what it's got to be, that's what it's got to be. And so I, he said, told me, he said, you can ask them not to do it around you. I said, okay, I'll do that. You know, and I wasn't going to bars, by the way. You know, we were hunting and stuff. And um, that's just the way it was. And so when I asked them, I never seen them again. <laughs> Took care of that, you know, didn't have to worry about that. But I do understand that because you, you, if you don't have a church to go to, if you don't have somebody to help you, you, you do kind of feel like you're, you're thrown out. Um, but that's a part of it. But I think what I really wanted to drive at is, and I don't think it's any different from a, a Christian in a church or one that's just been led and you're trying to disciple them. The whole point in, in my mind is to bring them into the crucial relationship with God. You know, I want to quit feeding that babe. I want eventually that babe to feed themselves. And I think the principle is the same. When we come to church here, we come here to fellowship with other people that believe of like faith and passion. We come here to hear a word of, from God to, and boy, I better back off from that because we want to hear from the word of God. I don't want to say a word of God. Because there's too many people to use that, and the idea is progressive. We're not progressive. We have it. That's it. You know, we don't need anything else but what God has already given us. But we need to, we need to come and fellowship around the Word. We need to come out of the world and be encouraged. That's the mission field. We get here. The ought to, this ought to be like. Uh, I think to use the term in, in, in Scripture, like the bomb of Gilead. When we come here, there ought to be a soothing effect getting around. There ought not be contention. There ought not be fighting. This should be more unity in family. And I, I do appreciate that. 
the idea of being able to come together. Um, sometimes the weeks are pretty tough, you know. Uh, but we uh, need to be able to uh, lead them uh, closer to God, to disciple them. In discipleship, I think there's two things we really look forward, look to do. Um, and he says here, he says, Wherefore, the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. Uh, I think the, the two things, you, and, and I'm going to address this in a minute, but there's two things as I disciple people that I'm looking for. First, as I'm looking for them to begin to start taking on the character of God. As they begin to, to pray, as they read their Bible, you will notice a difference in how they see things, the, uh, how they react to certain things. At first, they may laugh at the dirty jokes. They may still get in crowds of people and, and they may say things at times they shouldn't say. But the closer they get to God and the closer and the more of his character they take on, they also get something else by taking on the character of God. They, they change their old nature for a new nature. So you get rid of the old character and you get a new character. You get rid of the old nature and you take on that new nature. And that's when he begins to show himself forth in their life. That's when you begin to see some things. And that's what I, I, I tend to look for. I look for some any kind of little change. I look for people to... Can you remember the time when maybe your parents took you to church or you was going to church with somebody and you really didn't want to go? I can remember. I got some people in here shaking they don't remember. I said, well, I can remember. I can remember holding my head down. I said, man, I just can't wait to get out of here. I mean, uh, and I was a young boy and probably older in life as well a few times. I didn't want to be there. I didn't want to hear that preacher. He was boring. You know, just wanted to go home and get out of there and do what I wanted to do. But there come a time when I come because I enjoyed it. It was refreshing. I like to hear the preaching. I like to hear the, the old hymn song. And so my heart and my character and my nature was changed. And so, yeah, but this doesn't happen overnight. We have to, and it tells us here, give diligence. It's a command. Be diligent. In other words, what he's telling us is strive to carry out. And, and here it says, be diligent to make your calling. Strive to walk, walk worthy of your calling. Um, that calling is vocation. That's what it is. It's, it's what you were called to do. Tell me what you're called to do. And don't make it harder than you need to. Tell me what you're called to do. We're called to serve God. There's more to it than that. What else? Live for Him. Worship Him. Glorify Him. Honor Him. Can you also say part of your vocation is to get to know Him? You know, so all these things have a direct effect on you. And by the way, if it affects you, it's affecting other people. That's our vocation. We're, but this is not it. In getting these things, we also are called. To, we're not only called to separate ourselves to Him, but also we're called to reveal Him to the people. Uh, tell people about Him. To, to give uh, them the knowledge. Uh, if you would, just give testimony to God to people. If you don't have a life, like I said before, you can't give it vocally. You know, you can, but people will laugh at you. Um, maybe not to your face, but behind your back. So, uh, when a person tells you, and I'll, I'll use an illustration here. I had a, a, a fellow who needed some help uh, financially uh, to do some things and, and I said, okay, I'll do it. And I had every idea it, what it was going to be, but I said, okay, I'll do it. So I went and um, I helped him and, and we got him some things that he needed. And, and, and while we were talking, he says, well, you know, I'm called to serve God too. He's called me to do this. He's called me to do that. He's called me to do all these things. <clears throat> of course, I tried to talk to him later and he never heard my name before, so. You know how that goes. But anyway, well, I looked him up on the internet. I, I, I just happened to think about it. Somebody asked me if I had tried that, and I hadn't. So I looked him up on the internet. And I, I found a man there on the internet who had I helped. Picture was right there. 
and uh, they had some videos of him. Um, pretty ungodly. I said, I wish I'd have seen this. I wish I'd have looked it up before because it would have been a little different approach. I probably would have still helped him some, but maybe not as much. But honestly, God was teaching me. There were some things I needed to learn. Um, just because they're ungodly doesn't mean we never help. We may have to limit our help, but it's not that we never help, but we have to use some wisdom in there. So, <clears throat> as we grow, as we mature, take on his character, um, it says here to make your call and election sure. I think the growth is proof of our election. If there's no growth in an individual, how do you know they're ever saved? If there's no understanding of, of sin, uh, uh, right and wrong, uh, I guess I don't want to use right and wrong, but how about holy and unholy? How do I know that person has ever accepted Christ as Savior? If they're a babe in Christ, they've just got saved, you understand it. But after 10, 15, 20 years, if they're still on those things and they haven't grown, what is it that gives you that discernment? Indwelling Spirit of God. He gives you the thirst. He grows you in the character. He grows you in the nature. But you've got to be willing to engage and to be diligent in that engaging. So, I want to, to, to uh, go back here. Um, and it mentions here, it says, give diligence to make. Um, <clears throat> We're given in this verse instructions on how to walk worthy of our calling uh, in order that we are a proper ambassador for Christ's sake. He's, he, these things really tell you, they give you uh, uh, an idea or they give you a path, they give you directions that you might be able to do this. Uh, you don't need to fail, you don't need to bring reproach upon the name of God, but, if you're, if you, if you, if, but you need to be diligent. But the idea of make... It's interesting, it's not a one-time action. It is a continual process. It's like to, if you give diligence, making your calling and election sure. It's a continual thing. We never stop. Um, uh, we, are continual, we are to be continually diligent to do right. We are to carry out or continually carry out our responsibilities as an ambassador. We're to continually take on more of his character. You understand, it's a lifetime process if you would. If you're not continually acting right, you're not going to have uh, the testimony God wants you. If you're not continually spending your time uh, trying to get closer to God, and let me just put it this way, this is a little different, executing the commands of God. If you're not doing that, then you're, you're not going to have testimony before the lost. You're, you're, you're not going to have testimony before those who are immature in Christ. You're not going to be the picture of Christ they need to see. Um, it says, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. Um, for if ye do these things. Uh, there are two things introduced. Um, in this verse that we mentioned, it's talking about making our calling sure to embrace our vocation as Christ ambassador. The second one is to make our election sure. Um, and we talk again about the separation from the old life into the new life. Uh, these, these things, if you do, uh, it gives you an idea, at least it does in my mind, maybe I should say it that way, um, it gives me the idea of, of stability. If we do these things, um, we separate from our old life to the new life. Um, we step in the right path. I was, when I say paths, I was trying to think. Um, there are places that we've, we've been that, that people walk so much. Um, and, and I find this amazing. There's, there's, certain, there's certain cultures you go into that people do a lot of walking. And they walk, I mean, if... Where people would drive around in a mobile community, they might drive two blocks to get to a place a block away. But if you're in a different uh, type of community, one that the, uh, or culture where they're not mobile, they walk a lot, and so you have all these paths. It's kind of an interesting. You can sit up on the, the side of a hill and look down, and you can see where these people have walked so much that these paths are have no grass, and they're only this wide. 
But like animal paths, and they, they interweave and stuff. Oh, they're going over the Harold's house, and they're going over the Susan's, and he's going over to the store to buy bread, and, and then he's going over to the, or whatever it is. And they have all these paths. There's a lot of paths in this life that you can choose to make, or choose to take, but you need to choose the right ones. And the right ones are those that God approves of. And if you don't know the Word of God, if you're not spending time with God, if you're not uh, getting on or taking on the character of God and the nature of God, your choices can be blurry. We talk about blind. We talk about the sight, not being able to see the far off. How many of you made the decision in the past and you regret today? I got some. Oh, yeah. You know? You didn't see where that path was taking you. You know, there, there's all sorts of paths you can take. God says, you pick up these things and you'll begin to see clearly where those paths are leading you. How many of you can see young people today? And, and I know some of us, I won't call names because we're taping this, have people living on our property that we see they're, they're involved in things they shouldn't. And we see where that's going to lead them. You know, I, I talk with people sometimes and, and, and they tell me things and, and they make these proclamations and I see where they're going. I'm thinking, I go home and tell Vera, I said, this is a wreck getting ready to happen. Because I'm just waiting for them to hit the wall. I mean, they're, they're, you know, we see these things, but they don't see them. They're blind to them. Um, they're on a path where they don't see the outcome. God says, if you do these things, you're not going to fall into those traps. You're not, you're not going to get messed up like that. Uh, we gain stability when we head in the right direction we head to God we should make this the manner of our life um, did you notice anything he says for if you do these things it's a conditional it's conditional it's conditional on your choice but he says if you, if the, you make the right one if you do these things you should never fall. You're not going to have to worry about it. If you do these things, they're going to give you the ability to see what you could not see before. They're going to make some hidden things that they can bring them out, make them visible. Um, conditional clause. I look, um, and, and I'll just say these few things and I'll move on. I was thinking when I was thinking about this of, of Christ's likeness. I love the verse, Psalms 119, 165. Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. I had a pastor who used to say, you can get your feelings hurt, but you should never get offended. I didn't know where he got that until I ran across this verse. But you know, the, the idea is people may say things that hurt your feelings. You may, you may not like it, and they may hurt your feelings, they may embarrass you, whatever it is. But the, the truth is, it should not make you angry. It should not shut the door on your testimony to them or ability to reach out to them. How do you deal with that? You swallow it. <laughs> the best I can tell you, you swallow it. You, you grit your teeth and you go on. Um, uh, great peace have they. I believe when we look at these virtues, he's, he's talking about, he says, we're going back to verse 3, as according as his divine power is given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceedingly great and precious promises. By these you might be partakers of the divine nature. Right? Partakers have a part of the divine nature. Now, understanding this. Uh, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue to virtue, knowledge, to knowledge, temperance, to temperance, patience, and to patience, godliness, and to godliness, brotherly kindness, and brotherly kindness, charity. You know, when I look at these things, I believe these virtues activate that peace of God. If you have these things in your life, you're not going to get offended. Because you see God, and you see through, if, I can, if you allow me to use the term, spiritual eyes. You know, we no longer see the way we used to see. We see differently. And because of that, we understand or we have a, a partial understanding of the things of this world like God does. And it's like it doesn't affect us as much. They remove, I believe, these virtues. They remove the power of the flesh from off our lives. 
and allow the Spirit to control us, allow us to be in submission to the Holy Spirit. It allows us to, to, to surrender control of our life to God. If you are under the control of the Holy Spirit, do you think you could ever fail to please God? You listened to the end, but you didn't listen to the first part. If you are under the control of the Holy Spirit, if you're under control of the Holy Spirit, you'll always please God. Okay? <laughs> That's the whole point. You listen to that end, pleasing God, we know that's hard to do. But if you're under the control of the Spirit, you'll always please God. You'll always, uh, you'll never fail if I could to please Him. You'll never fall from His grace. Um, but that requires, as it said in this verse, a continual march in our vocation. What He's called us to do. Let me, let me caution you. Don't allow yourself to get sidetracked. Um, remember what 2 Timothy 2.4 says? It says, as a good soldier, I'll read it. I wrote it down here. It says, no man that warreth entangled himself with the affairs of life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. One focus and one focus only, Christ likeness. Take on the character and nature of God that you might impart that or help other people get that. Um, verse 11 says, for so an interest shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I found this verse a little interesting. It was a little struggle for me at first. Um, it says, for so an interest. The idea I get here is, is I see this as in the manner we are to be led. These virtues, once, in, once we begin to grow in them, they lead us in the manner that we should be led. Um, these virtues help guide us in paths of righteousness. They form a course uh, uh, or a manner of conduct, if you would, a, a way or manner of thinking, of feeling, of deciding. If you can change your way of thinking, you will change the way you feel about things. If you change your feeling and your thinking, you will change the decisions you make. That comes in Christ. He says these virtues have a tremendous impact on that. If you want the mind of God, these things ingrained in you. And I, I, I really, uh, the more I, I look at these things, I push for Bible reading. I heard a man once say, if you'll let me choose your books, I'll mow your mind. If you let me choose the books you read, I'll mow your mind. He also said, and this was a different, I, I don't want to say he also, a different a man said, if you will let me supply the books that the youth of your country lead, uh, read, I will take control of their minds. Meaning he will implant to them. Who implants today all these things into the minds of our kids? Liberal media, and, and I'll say it like I, I see it, liberal people who are in our colleges and in our schools. They don't believe like we do, and they, they're pushing a whole different ideology. I mean, they're... they're, they're, they're they're caustic, if you would, to the things of Christ. They're hostile to us. And so these people are molding the minds. I think I said this last time, so I'll quit beating on that horse. I don't mean to ride any hobbies. Um, but they're forming, if you would, because of what they're pushing on our children, they're forming their course of conduct or the manner in which they will conduct their lives. They're forming their, the way and manner in which they will think and feel and decide. Do you like their decisions yet? Well, I certainly don't. Okay. Um, these things form the foundations for all our decisions in life. Um, so when we're controlled by the Spirit of God, that's the foundation for our decisions. Surrendering ourselves to God, growing in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ, picking up these virtues He'd have us add. And by the way, if you look down into this he says shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and in verse 12 he makes this statement wherefore I will not be negligent I will not be negligent he has played he is telling you the importance of, of us 
having these things in our life. He says, I'll not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things. These are number one for him. Um, well, I don't want to get into that. That's, I'm going to get into something I want to teach next time. I'm going to go ahead and stop here. I'm out of time. Anybody have anything they want to add or, or, or you know, something they want to throw? Or I can still dodge. All right, let's go ahead and, and knock that off then.